Hello, this is Katie, your EMT instructor. Let's go over the human body chapter. It's important to have a working knowledge of anatomy. Knowledge of anatomy helps to communicate correct information to other medical professionals and to others who may not understand our medical terms. There are superficial landmarks to the body that serve as guides to structures that lie beneath. Topographical anatomy applies to the body in the anatomical position, which is when the patient is standing forward towards you, arms at the side, and palms forward. Some directional terms that you need to know help us to know where an injury is located and how the pain radiates in the body. Superior refers to things that are closer to the head, and inferior infer refers to things that are closer to the feet. Terms describe the relationship of one structure to another. For example, the knee is superior to the foot and inferior to the pelvis. Lateral means further away from the midline. Medial are parts of the body that are closer to the midline. Proximal and distal describe the relationship of two structures on an extremity. Proximal is closer to the trunk and distal is further away. Superficial means closer to the skin surface, and deep means further inside the body or in the body tissue. Ventral refers to the belly side of the body, and dorsal refers to the spine side of the body. Anterior is the complete front surface of the body, and posterior is the back surface of the body. Palmer refers to the palm of the hand, and plantar is the bottom of the foot. The term apex is a tip of a structure, and bilateral means both sides on a patient's body. The ab abdominal quadrant, the, the abdominal cavity is divided into four equal quadrants. We call them the right upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, the left upper quadrant, and the left lower quadrant. We use these terms to describe location of injuries and assessment findings on our patient. Some medical personnel will know where to look and what to expect. Some anatomical positions we might find, treat, or transport our patient could include prone or supine. Prone is when a patient is laying face down, and supine is when a patient is laying flat on their back. The term Fowler's position is a semi-reclining with the head elevated. A high Fowler's is when a patient is sitting at a 90 degree angle. The first system we're gonna talk about is the skeletal system. The skeletal system gives us our recognizable human form. It protects internal organs, and it contains bones, ligaments, tendons, and cartilage. The axial skeleton is the foundation to which the arms and legs are attached, including the skull, the spinal column, and the thorax. The skull is made up of two portions of bones, the cranium, which is made up of four portions of the bone in the back of the skull, and the face is made up of 14 bones. The important bones to know in this, chap in this slide is the maxilla, which is the upper jaw, and the mandible, which is the lower jaw. That's important when we get into the airway discussion. The spinal column is composed of 33 vertebrae that are stacked on top of each other with intervertebral discs cushioning in between each vertebrae. The names and numbers are important to know. We start at the top with the cervical spine that has seven vertebrae, going down to the thoracic, which have 12 vertebrae. The lumbar has five vertebrae, the thorax has also five vertebrae, and the coccyx, or the tailbone, have four fused vertebrae. The thorax is formed by 12 thoracic vertebrae and 12 paired ribs. The thoracic cavity contains the heart, the lungs, the esophagus, and the great vessel. So the thoracic cavity is important for protection of the, um, I'm sorry, touching the mic, does that mess it up? Okay. The thorax is formed by 12 thoracic vertebrae and 12 paired ribs. The thorax contains the heart, lungs, esophagus, and great vessel. The appendicular skeleton are the arms, legs, and their connection points, and the pelvis. This includes the joints, upper extremities, pelvis, and lower extremities. Joints occur whenever bones come into contact. It consists of the ends of the bones and the connecting and supporting tissues, 
Two types of joints include the ball and socket and a hinge joint. You would find a ball and socket in the hip, shoulder, and then the hinge joint would be the knee and the elbow. The upper extremity extends from the shoulder girdle down to the fingertips, including the humerus, the elbow, the shoulder, the clavicle, scapula, radius, ulna, wrist, hands, and fingers. The humerus is the upper supporting bone of the arm, and the forearm consists of two bones called the radius, which is the bigger, more structurally sound bone, and the ulna. The pelvis is a closed bony ring consisting of three bones, the sacrum and two pelvic bones. Posteriorly, the ilium, ischium, and pubis are joined at the sacrum, and anteriorly, the pubic symphysis is where the right and left pubis are joined. The main parts of the lower extremity include the leg, the thigh, and the foot. The femur is the large bone in the thigh. It's the largest bone in the body. It connects to the acetabulum, or the pelvic girdle, by a ball and socket joint. The greater and lesser trochanter are where the major muscles of the thigh connect to the femur. The knee connects the upper leg to the lower leg. The lower leg consists of the shin bone, which is the tibia, and the less supportive bone in the lower leg called the fibula. Then there's an ankle, which is a hinge joint, which allows for flexion and extension of the foot, and then five toes on each foot. The skeletal system gives the body its shape, protects fragile organs, allows for movement, stores calcium, and makes blood cells. The musculoskeletal system provides form, upright posture, movement, and protection of internal vital organs. There are three types of muscle, the skeletal or voluntary muscle, smooth or involuntary, and cardiac muscle, which we call myocardium. Contraction and relaxation of the system make it possible to move and manipulate your environment. A byproduct of this movement is heat. Another function of the muscles is to protect the structures underneath them. The respiratory system is structures of the body that contribute to respiration, which is the process of breathing. This is a very important slide, and you need to know all the structures included in the airway. The upper airway includes the nose, the mouth cavity, the tongue, jaw, larynx, pharynx, trachea, and epiglottis. The lower airway starts at the larynx and includes the thyroid cartilage, cricoid cartilage, and the trachea. The trachea ends at the carina, dividing into the right and left bronchi, leading to the bronchioles. Two lungs are held in place by the trachea, arteries and veins that innervate the lungs, and the pulmonary ligaments. The lungs are divided into lobes. There are two on the left side and three lobes on the right side. Within the lobes are bronchi, bronchioles, and then alveoli. The pleura is a layer of smooth, glistening tissue that cover each lung and line the chest cavity. The muscles used for breathing include the diaphragm and intercostal muscles. They are the primary muscles for breathing. Also involved are your neck muscles, abdominal muscles, and pectoral muscles, especially when patients are under distress or having trouble breathing. The function of the respiratory system is to provide the body with oxygen and eliminate waste, which is carbon dioxide. Ventilation and respiration are two interdependent functions of the respiratory system. Respiration is the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the alveoli and the tissues of the body. This provides oxygen to the cells and removes the waste carbon dioxide. The term diffusion is the process in which oxygen molecules move from areas with higher concentration of oxygen to areas of lower concentration. This is all controlled by your brainstem. Ventilation is the simple act of moving air in and out of your lungs. This requires rise and fall of the chest. Tidal volume is the amount of air moved in and out of the lungs during a, during a single breath, and this is evaluated by measuring chest rise on the patient. The term residual volume is the gas that remains in the lungs that's needed to keep the lungs open. The term dead space is the portion of respiratory system that has no alveoli and where little or no exchange of air occurs. 
Respiratory rate times tidal volume is called minute volume. This is the amount of air a patient can move in and out of their lungs in a minute. Always evaluate the amount of air being moved with each breath when assessing a patient's respirations. Some characteristics of normal breathing that we like to see in patients are a normal rate and depth, regular rhythm, clear audible noises on both sides of the chest, regular rise and fall of the chest, and slight movement of the abdomen. Inadequate breathing in patients include labored breathing, muscle retractions, cyanotic, pale, cool, and damp skin, tripod positioning, and agonal gasps or gasping breaths. The circulatory system is a complex arrangement of connected tubes arteries, arterioles, capillaries, venules, and veins. We have two circuits in our body, systemic circulation, which moves blood around our body, and the pulmonary circulation, which moves blood in and out of our lungs. This slide is the circulation of blood through the body. It's important to know this slide. We'll be going over this. The heart is a hollow muscular organ that's about the size of a clenched fist. It's made up of specialized cardiac cells and it works as two paired pumps. There's a right side and a left side of the heart that's divided by a septum. And each side is divided into a top or an upper chamber and a lower chamber. The upper chamber is called the atrium and the ventricles are the lower chamber. The heart receives blood from the aorta. The right side receives deoxygenated blood from the veins or from the body and the left side receives oxygenated blood from the lungs. This is an important part of this course, the circulation of blood through the body. How do patients move oxygenated and deoxygenated blood? We'll start in the right atrium. The deoxygenated blood enters the right atrium from the body. It then goes down to the right ventricle. The right ventricle pumps that deoxygenated blood to the lungs through the pulmonary arteries. The lungs takes that carbon dioxide that's diffused out, gets rid of it, and then takes in the oxygenated blood. It leaves the lungs through the pulmonary veins to the left atrium, where this oxygenated blood then goes down to the left ventricle, where it is pumped to the body through the aorta. The blood is brought back to the heart through the vena cava to the right atrium. The electrical conduction system causes smooth coordinated contractions of the heart. These contractions produce a pumping action so that blood is pumped through the body. Arteries carry blood from the heart to all body tissues. It branches into different parts of different arteries that feed blood to parts of the body. The pulmonary arteries specifically carry oxygen-poor blood back to the lungs. Arteries branch into smaller arteries and then into arterioles. Arterioles branch into increasingly smaller vessels until they connect to the capillaries where the exchange of blood happens. A pulse is palpated most easily in the neck, wrist, or groin. This pulse is created by a forceful contraction of blood out of the ventricle of the heart. Capillaries connect arterioles to venules. It's the fine end division of the arterial system. It allows for contact between blood and cells. Veins return oxygen depleted blood back to the heart. The superior vena cava brings blood returning from the head, shoulders, neck, and upper extremities. The inferior vena cava brings blood from the belly, pelvis, and lower extremities, and they join at the right atrium. The spleen is a solid organ located under the rib cage. It filters blood, particularly susceptible to injury from blunt trauma and can lead to severe internal bleeding. Blood is made of four parts, plasma, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets. Plasma is the liquid portion of the blood. Red blood cells carry oxygen. White blood cells fight infection and platelets are used for clotting. Blood pressure is pressure that blood exerts against the walls of the arteries when the left ventricle contracts. The systolic number of a blood pressure is when the left ventricle of the heart contracts. It pumps blood from the ventricle to the aorta. 
The systolic number of a blood pressure is when the muscle of the ventricle relaxes and the ventricles can fill with blood. An average blood pressure for an adult is 120 over 80. We measure that in systolic, the high point of the wa wave, and diastolic, the low point of the wave. Normal circulation in adults is automatically adjusted and controlled based on your need. We call this perfusion. Perfusion is the circulation of blood in organs or tissues in the amount needed to meet the needs of your cells. Blood enters organs and tissues through arteries and blood leaves organs and tissues through veins. The system can adjust to small amounts of blood loss. Our vessels will constrict and our heart will pump more rapidly. With large blood loss though, adjustment fails and patients will go into shock. Again, the functions of the blood are for perfusion, transporting oxygen, carbon dioxide, waste, nutrients, and for clotting or coagulation. The nervous system controls our cardiovascular system. The sympathetic nervous system is responsible for our fight or flight response. It sends commands to our adrenal glands and epinephrine or adrenaline and norepinephrine are secreted to stimulate the heart and blood vessels in an emergency to save your life. The nervous system is perhaps the most complex organ in the body and we'll go over very basically right now the two parts which are the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system includes the brain which is the controlling organ of the body. Subdivisions of the brain include cerebrum, cerebellum, and the brain stem. The spinal cord is just an extension of the brain stem. It transmits information and messages between the brain and the body. The peripheral nervous system is divided into two main portions, the somatic nervous system and the autonomic nervous system. The somatic transmits signals from the brain to our voluntary muscles. The autonomic controls our involuntary actions, and it's split into two areas, the sympathetic, which controls our fight or flight, and the parasympathetic, which we call rest and digest. The skin is the largest organ in the body. It has two layers, the epidermis, which is the most superficial, and dermis, which is the deeper layer. Deeper to the dermis is the subcutaneous layer, which has our fat that insulates and serves as an energy reservoir. Three major functions of the skin, to protect the body from the environment, to regulate body temperature, and to transmit information from the environment to the brain. The digestive system. Digestion is the processing of food that nourishes the cells. The abdomen is the second major body cavity, it contains, contains major organs of digestion and excretion, organized into four quadrants, which we went over before, the right upper quadrant, the left upper quadrant, and then the right and left lower quadrants. The digestive system, starting in the upper part of the body, includes the mouth, the oropharynx, the esophagus, the stomach, the pancreas, the liver, the intestines, the appendix, and the rectum. Enzymes are added to food to break them down. Salivary glands, the stomach, liver, pancreas, and the small intestine all aid in digestion. Food is then converted into basic sugars, fatty acids, and amino acids that the body can use for energy. Elements of the lymphatic system include the spleen, lymph nodes, vessels of the lymph, the thymus gland, and other components. The lymphatic system supports the circulatory system and immune system. Lymph is a thin, straw-colored fluid that carries oxygen and nutrients to cells and waste products away. The endocrine system is a complex message and control system. It integrates many body functions, and hormones are released directly into the bloodstream, including epinephrine, norepinephrine, and ins insulin. The brain controls the release of these hormones, and excesses or deficiencies in hormones can cause disease, for example, diabetes. The urinary system controls discharge of certain waste materials filtered from the blood by the kidneys. This controls fluid balance in the body. It filters and eliminates your waste and controls pH balance. 
The urinary system consists of the kidneys, ureter, and urinary bladder. Pathophysiology is the study of functional changes that occur when the body reacts to disease. Respiratory compromise is the ability of the body to move gases effectively. We'll go over what hypoxia and hypercarbia are later in the chapters. Factors that can impair ventilation include a blocked airway, impairment of the muscles of breathing, airway obstructed physiologically, for example, asthma, and other factors. Factors that can impair respiration include changes in the atmosphere, high altitudes, and impaired movement of gas across your cellular membrane. The effects of respiratory compromise on the body include oxygen levels start to fall and carbon dioxide levels increase. Respiratory rate increases to try to compensate for this loss of oxygen in the system. Your body becomes more acidic and the brain sends commands to the body to breathe.